Okay, colleagues, greetings and welcome back. So today I want to talk about a text which I find extremely important for our present moment. And um, this is a text by John Hobson um, on imperialism, the text which has been written in 1905. Well, it's written in 1902 and then published the second edition, the standard edition is published in 1905. So it's a text that has been published before the First World War. And I think that there's a very good case to be made that, the, that World War I is the most important um, defining event for our present, you know, present moment in time. Now, you could also ask what led to World War I. And, you know, some, there's an argument to be made that the, the failed revolutions, the failed democratic revolutions of 1848, the spring of Europe, have set in motion certain wheels that led to World War I. You could say that Industrial Revolution together with the French Revolution led to World War I, and these are all valid arguments. But World War I, as a singular event, the immense destruction um, of the, you know, flower of the European youth and of the leading specimens of European culture, I mean, in terms of, like, uh, cultural achievements, like, the, the optimism, a large part of uh, humanity's optimism about the future died in World War I. That's what I'm trying to say. And um, so there's this highly important text, which I want to talk about. Um, and this is by again, by John Hobson, and I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to actually read, we're going to read an article, which I used to assign for many years now, so the reason I assigned this article is just because I think it's a, it's a very easy article to read, it's a summary of Hobson with the quotations, because I want to keep this as short as possible, and the article is by Berg Berberoglu, who is uh, an American, well, Turkish, Amer Turkish born American professor of international relations at the University of Nevada, uh, Reno, 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 Nevada, something like that. Uh, uh, I'll give bibliographical details in a second. So um, there's a million things I want to say, but let me get into the text and then like, perhaps this is not the last time. I, I, I already have, mm, keep in mind, I keep, I, I like talking about Hobson and I do talk about Hobson from time to time just because I think Hobson is so immensely important. Like he's, I guess, like, uh, um, I think John Maynard, Maynard Keynes held Hobson in high regard and um, also Hobson is famous because Lenin quotes Hobson a lot. But Lenin is complicated and controversial. Even if you don't like Lenin, I mean, Hobson was not a Marxist. He was a liberal and a socialist at the same time, which was a normal combination back in the day. Um, and we're gonna, so we're gonna, we're gonna see an argument which looks to some extent like a Marxist argument, but, but if you're allergic to Marx, if you hate Marxists, this is not per se a Marxist argument. So let me, let me get let me get into the text. Well, yeah, before I get into the text, let me say a couple of words. So, so first of all, so this is we're going to be reading from this book so by Berberoglu, 2003. The name of the book is Globalization, Capital, and the Nation State. Imperialism, Class Struggle, and the State in the Age of Global Capitalism. And again, the, the, the reason we're reading this is because it has a very nice summary of Hobson, because I want to keep this short. Uh, and these are, these are the bibliographical details. So Hobson... Uh, it's called Imperialism, a Study, written in 1902, the definitive edition published in 1905. So he's a reformist liberal socialist. Mm. Berber Beroglu, again, University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, and I gave you the name of the book. Anyway, yeah, so before we start reading the text, several, you know, a couple of disclaimers. I feel this is very important. So I specialize in ancient texts, not modern data. The name of our subject is Introduction to interna International Political Theory. So we specialize in theory. I, I think that there's use in theory. We could talk about this for a long time. Um, but theory is one thing. Data is another thing. Data tends to be very messy. So a couple of disclaimers. So I specialize in ancient texts, not modern data. And that's the thing number one. Thing number two, when we talk about data, sociology or economics, social theory, like in general, is not rocket science. It's much harder than rocket science. There's a good reason to believe that, or like, like even in physics, simple interactions, like the three-body problem, going back to Poincaré, the three-body problem is already impossible to solve exactly, as far as I remember, like in terms of differential equations. So even already like three simple bodies orbiting each other in space, like even that kind of a problem is not exactly solvable uh, uh, um, in physics, right? So once you get from physics 
like if you believe the standard physicalistic picture which many people do which is kind of which is the standard dominant picture in the in the philosophy of sciences that we have today uh, you go from physics to chemistry Ch chemistry is already much more complex than chemistry biology much more complex than chemistry than so, hmm. so physics on top of it chemistry chemistry more complex than physics then biology more complex than chemistry then psychology more complex than biology the idea is that you have these stacking levels and so social theory would just be so much more complex and it's much more difficult to do a controlled experiment you don't have you know 15 planet earths that you can shuffle so it's always important to be careful around these arguments so what i want to present is this again an argument a point of view an ideal type don't rush to conclusions don't jump to conclusions because the article does have very strong conclusions um and last disclaimer uh, uh, well, yeah, okay, so here don't ju jump to conclusions. And then the last disclaimer is that I remind you that in general we're dealing with ideal types. We're dealing with ideal types in theory, right? We're not dealing with truth with a capital T, but with ideal types. And so I like to think of this in terms of this, you know, parliament or council. Like uh, um, in society, that's what we want to have. We want to have like in the parliament, we want to have different wings of the parliament, different people paying attention to different things, and then these points of view being in contact and in dialogue with one another. That's basically how we move ahead. This is how we progress as a society. And the same thing goes for an individual. Like the purpose of education, like if you take my course on Coursera, in Introduction to Political Philosophy, I, I, there's something on the order of 16 thinkers, so you get like 16 different modules in your head, like 16 different mini persons in your head that you can uh, 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 kind of uh, call up on demand and ask in your head, like, what would Aristotle say about this? What would Hegel say about this? What would Ed Edmund Burke or David Hume say about this particular issue? This is, this is, this is kind of, again, this is the approach that we have at, in the University of London. Again, John Stuart Mill, Free, you know, a free and equal discussion, and mm, this is a very important phrase here. This is polyphony for the sake of polyphony. So even if, uh, so kind of, you know, polyphony for the sake of polyphony, and it's important to always look on the best argument on the other side. Always look for the best argument on the other side. And um, this is true for the text that we're going to be looking at. Or perhaps if you find this text uncongenial, then it's true kind of <laughs> against the text, right? So it's like if these, like if um, if something doesn't sit right with you, like like if you don't, if you're not gonna, if you you're not gonna write, if you, if you are not going to like the conclusions that the text presents, then you should be open to the text still because you want to find in this text arguments against your position. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, if the text that we're going to read, if you agree with Hobson on everything, then the proper philosophical thing to do is to look for the best arguments against Hobson. Okay, that's the that's the ethics, pedagogical ethics of the University of London. Um, so, without further ado, let me jump into the text. So, and I, again, I find this a deeply important text. It's the 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 the. Um, the rhetoric is very simple, so so let's you know we'll start it and we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm I guess I'm going to read large chunks of it. Mm. So we begin the discussion with an examination of the work of an eminent British economist, John Hobson, whose work *Imperialism: A Study*, again second edition, published in 1905, played a key role in the formulation of you know, much later arguments developed by Lenin. Yes, yeah, so so um, Lenin is kind of Hobson is most famous as a predecessor for Lenin, but he's esteemed in his own right. Again, Keynes, for example, was a fan of Hobson. So, um, do you need my face? Do you need my face here? Let me, let me perhaps just focus on the text. Um, so, imperialism, Hobson writes at the turn of the 20th century, implies the use of machinery of government by private interests, mainly capitalists, to secure for them economic gains outside the country. Mm -hmm. So, immediately, kind of, uh, those of you who are um, attuned to Rousseau, this difference between private interests corporate interest, interest of the section of the population versus the interest of the country as a whole. Uh, again, I, the assumption behind Marxism, between, behind classical liberalism, people like Adam Smith or people like John Stuart Mill, is that 99, well, overwhelming proportion of the population has overwhelming interests in common, right? So we're talking about these private sectional interests against the interests of the majority. And in fact, as we're going to see in Hobson, even these private interests are potentially undermined. And of, of course, if you think in terms of World War One, yes, and was World War One in the interest of the ruling class? Well, it's, it's a difficult question, but many people belonging to the ruling class, to the ruling classes of the European powers, 
have suffered, I mean, tremendously, you know, lost their fortunes, lost their children, lost their lives in World War I. So it was not, not in anybody's interest. And of course, World War I is the immediate context for what Hobson is writing, because he's writing on the eve of World War I, foreseeing that World War I is going to happen. And this is a theoretical explanation in Hobson of why World War I is going to happen, that, again, Marxists are going to expand on. Um, but, of course, we're reading this text today, in the 21st century, because we feel that these arguments are still valid, and I think you will see, and students tell me that, again, I don't specialize in contemporary, let's say, American politics, but people tell me, students tell me that this is very readily applicable to present-day situation as well. Anyway, so let's continue. So the economic root of imperialism is the desire of strong, organized industrial and financial interests to secure and develop at the public expense and by the public force private mar markets for their surplus goods and their surplus capital. So all of this is very important. So we're talking about public expense for private gains. So socialize the cost, privatize the benefit. Socialize the cost, privatize the benefit. Why? Why are we doing this? Again, this is an argument which... The Marxists have developed, but it's there uh, in people before Marx, in people like um, Ricardo, David Ricardo, this idea that, um, well, I mean, economists, mainstream economists before Marx knew that there was a tendency for crisis of overproduction. So we're talking about surplus goods and surplus capital. If if this was a longer, if I mean, feel free to ask me, but of course, for Marx, these are two parts of the same coin, precisely because there's exploitation in the technical sense precisely because there's exploitation in a technical sense. That's why uh, you get at the same time surplus goods and surplus capital at the same time. Um, and in fact, I guess uh, in the preliminary fashion, uh, this, the amount of surplus capital is approximately equal to, to the surplus goods, the goods that you cannot, the, you cannot sell because you have taken capital out of circulation. And the uh, capitalists are, no, are not going to... Uh, the bourgeoisie are not going to spend the money, they're not going to consume, they're going to try to invest. And that's why, because they're not consuming but trying to invest, that's why you get surplus goods and surplus capital at the same time. Anyway, um, let's continue. So imperialism, whether it consists in the further policy of expansion or rigorous maintenance, so, so expansion, colonial expansion, or the rigorous maintenance, so, you know, uh, 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 the maintenance of uh, colonial oppression, colonial domination, of all those vast tropical lands which have been earmarked as the British spheres of influence. So British spheres of influence, today you can talk about other spheres of influence, and, mm, well, um, some people like Hart and Negri, so um, they would talk about how uh, today the only real empire is the global capitalist empire, and the capitals of this global capitalist empire are in Washington, in London, in Brussels, but it's a single unified, uh, well, it's more or less single, more or less unified global capitalist empire, which is uh, uh, to a large extent, you know, sustained by um, U.S. military power. Um, and then kind of Hart and Negri would say it's not exactly appropriate to talk about, uh, uh, well, kind of... Uh, uh, Empires besides this one. That there's one empire. And, you know, this raises interesting questions, problematic questions about multipolarism. Um, questions I'm honestly, I, my mind is not yet made up, so these are difficult questions. I'm going to leave it for a future discussion, but it's, you know, it's a question to keep in mind. Anyway, so we talk about, again, uh, uh, um, imperialism, further policy of expansion, rigorous maintenance of the possessions. And this, this could be, of course, direct military power or... This could be soft power. Like you, you can have like outright possessions or you can have like uh, um, patron-client relationships. I mean, students of international relations will understand. Anyway, so, and so uh, uh, um, Hobson says that imperialism implies militarism now and ruinous wars in the future. Again, he's writing in 1905. This is very, very, very prescient. The ruin, ruinous wars in the future, of course, is going to be World War I. Um... So the main purpose of Hobson's study is to demonstrate that the new imperialism has an, has an insignificant... Oh, yeah, so, so, so what Hobson is trying to do is he's trying to argue that, uh, uh, that actually um, uh, imperialism is not really in the interests of the vast majority of the population. Like, the vast majority of the population does not benefit from the imperialistic policies, right? Um... So he, he, he calls it, he calls it, 
an irrational and unnecessary policy. And so when he says it has an insignificant commercial value, he means that the private interests can gain significantly, you know, by public expenditure, but uh, again, uh, yeah, so socialize the cost, privatize the benefit. There's public expenditure, and then there's um, private gains. But as a whole, to the nation, it's a detriment. Uh, peace dividend. Think of think of this phrase, peace dividend. Of course, uh, again, if if you talk about this in the context of contemporary situation, you have to think. You know, w one example that immediately immediately comes to mind is war on terror. The U.S. led American war on terror, right? And uh, what was the cost? And again, this phrase about a peace dividend. Peace dividend. How much money? How many resources? How many lives were spent? How much goodwill? American goodwill was destroyed in the process of these wars, and Hobson is going to talk about something very similar. And the question, the big question is, was it worth it, right? And mm, realists like John Mearsheimer, for example, would ask specifically this question, like, is this money well spent? Like, like was, was, this a, uh, um, was this a sound policy for the U.S.? But anyway, let me continue with Hobson. So the absorption of so large a portion of public interest, energy, blood, and money in seeking to procure colonial possessions and foreign markets would seem to indicate that Great Britain obtained her chief livelihood by external trade. Um, so, and he's going to argue, no, that's that's not, that's not where Great Britain makes its livelihood. Uh, um, large as was our foreign and colonial trade in volume and value, essential as was much of it to our national well-being, nevertheless, it furnished a small proportion of total industry of the nation. The distinctive feature of modern imperialism from a commercial standpoint is that it adds to our empire tropical and subtropical regions with which our trade is small, precarious, and unprogressive. Uh, the entire volume of our export trade forms an utterly insignificant part of our national income, while the expenses, so it's an insignificant part of income, it's an insignificant part of income, but it's a very significant part of expense. Expenses connected directly and indirectly with the acquisition administration uh, 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 must swallow an immeasurably larger sum, right? So again, private benefits, public costs. Um, so... It's an unwise policy from the standpoint of British economy and society, but also in terms of its exploitative consequences in the colonies, which arouse the sentiment of the oppressed people. And again, so people talk about, for example, anti-Americanism today. Um, if we extrapolate Hobson's argument, right, so you, you're not just spending blood and money, but you're also spending goodwill, blowback, blowback, and you're cre generating blowback and bad will, right, uh, a negative sentiment against you. Mm. This concern led Hobson to raise the central question of his study, how is the British nation induced to embark upon such um, uh, an unsound business? And uh, um, by the way, so today in the US, as far as I understand, the populist isolationist sentiment is gaining in popularity. So this is it's a very pertinent question. Like uh, Hobson asked, asked this about the British, you could ask this about the US today. Like um, why do the majority of people not protest as much as, as perhaps they should, according to Hobson. Again, in terms of their in, 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 protest, merely based on their own self-serving interest. Um, anyway, so he had no hesitation in his mind to the reply that the only possible answer is that the business interests of the nation as a whole are subordinate to those of certain sectional interests. So again, the, if you want in Rousseauian terms, the general will is subsumed to the corporate will, the sectional interest, that usurp, usurp, control of the national resources and use them for private gain. Mm -hmm. So sectional interests usurp control of national resources and use them for private gain. Again, this uh, privatize, uh, um, privatize the benefits, socialize the costs. This is basically what I keep repeating. So although the new imperialism has been bad business for the nation, it has been good business for certain classes and certain trades within the nation. And while Britain's imperialist course appears irrational from the point of view of nation as a whole, again, say hello to Rousseau's general will, an analysis of the relationship between business and politics will show that imperialism viewed from another angle um, is far more rational, you know, but only for certain classes. The aggressive imperialism is not in the main the product of blind passion 
of races or of the mixed folly ambition of politicians. It's far more rational. Mm -hmm. So rational, so rational enough from the standpoint of certain. Okay, sorry, this is a re repetition, repeating the same the same line. Rational, but oh, it, imperialism is rational, but only for certain classes. Perhaps you could say today, in terms of military industrial complex, there are very few. Like in the U.S. today, sixty percent of the population live from paycheck to paycheck. Think about this in terms of peace dividend. Peace. Are our majority of Americans gaining peace dividend? Or is it that America gets generates a tremendous amount of bad will and blowback around the world, and it's only basically good for the shareholders of the military-industrial complex? So in the implications of Hobson's analysis thus far lead us to conclude that there exists in the national economy interests that benefit directly or indirectly from imperialist expansion. Whose interests are those? Um, so certain definite business and professional interests feeding upon imperialistic ex expenditure are thus set in opposition to the common good. The common good. It's a word I use a lot. Um, anyway, certain big firms engaged in building warships. So basically, what's all the military-industrial complex? This is just straightforwardly military-industrial complex. M-I-C. Um, um, anyway, equipping and... Uh, uh, Equipping and calling them manufacturing guns, rifles, ammunition, planes, and motor vehicles of every kind, supplying horses, wagons, salary, food, clothing for the services, contracting for barracks and other large irregular needs. Think about this again, military industrial company. And again, think, you know, Hobson is writing in 1905. He is not, you know, he's not a paid agent who writes against the U.S. policy today, right? This is this is why I think it's very good uh, to take a long view of things, right? It's 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 good to take a look at, uh, 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 so to speak, ancient ancient theory, if you want, right? Uh, because because it it gives it gives a certain well, I mean, 1905 is not that ancient, but you understand it gives you benefit of hindsight. Right, and and you can suspect people of particular, like um, you can suspect certain actors in the st on the on the world stage today as being kind of compromised and just being you know uh, vehicles or vessels for particular kind of uh, kinds of propaganda. But I don't I don't think that Hobson here engages in any kind of propaganda. I don't I don't think he was paid to to say these things. This is like his honest assessment as a British citizen. Anyway. Um, so, through these main channels, the millions flow to feed uh, the many subsidiary trades, most of which are quite aware that they are engaged in executing contracts for the services. Here we have an important nucleus of commercial imperialism. Some of these trades, anyway, you, you understand, military-industrial complex, um, are conducted by large firms with immense capital whose heads are well aware of the uses of political influences for trade purposes. Political influences for trade purposes. Today we will talk about the corruption of big money in politics, right? These men are imperialists by conviction. Pushful policy is good for them. With them stand the great manufacturers for export trade. Aha, so great manufacturers for export trade who gain living by supplying the real or artificial wants. Interesting distinction. Real or artificial wants of new countries we annex or open up. So again, this is uh, very much against the... Um, this facile neoclassical economic view that, oh, trade is always good. No, you can see in, in the writings of um, Hobson here, again, these, these, uh, this notion that trade is often a, a, a hostile uh, policy, right? You, you're, you're opening up, you know, through, especially you know, if you can engage in damping, undercutting, there are all sorts of like trade wars, there are all sorts of economic policies that can be very hostile. And again, neoclassical economics doesn't pay nearly enough uh, uh, proper attention to it. Anyway, so Manchester, Sheffield, Birmingham, mm, full of firms, competing, pushing textiles and hardware, etc., etc., and the public debts which ripen in our colonies and foreign countries that come under our protectorate or influence are largely loaned in shape of rails, engines, guns, and other material civilization sent out by the British firms. This is also going to be hugely important. So we're talking about the public debts in foreign countries, the public debts in foreign countries, because we are talking here, we're talking about the export of, again, this is, Marx is also going to say the same thing, that um, capitalism generates excess goods, so overproduction, overproduction of goods, but also um, there's going to be surplus capital. So you need new markets 
to sell your goods, but also to invest your capital. And the way you invest your capital is that you indebt the other nations. You put the other nations in debt, like debt trap diplomacy, right? And so you, you, you make the other countries indebted to you. And then in order to make sure that they repay the debts, you employ the military. But again, that's the whole point that Hobson is making, that this uh, strategy, again, it's the, 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 the costs are socialized. It's the country as the whole who pays for the military industrial complex and who pays in blood. Uh, uh, people who serve in the army, right? But the gains from these debts, among other things, are going to be private. Anyway, um, making railways, canals, development of mines, uh, stimulate a definite interest to, imp to important manufacturing industries which feed a very firm imperialist faith in their owners. Anyway, in contrast to these small gains from external trade, Britain's global strategy of expansion rested primarily on foreign investment. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, we're talking about foreign investment. By far, the most important economic factor in imperialism is the influence relating to investment. The growing cosmopolitanism of capital, capital has no country, Marx will remind us. And that's why labor, that's why workers have to unionize across state lines, across state, that's why workers of the world have to unite if we are to defeat cosmopolitanism of capital. Mm -hmm. um, it's the greatest economic change of recent generations, cosmopolitanism of capital, every advanced industrial nation has been tending to place a larger share of its capital outside the limits of its own political arena in foreign countries or in colonies and to draw growing, growing income from this source. And again, kind of you have this notion, right? At home, there's not enough money. There's not enough money for the working class. Again, 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, but no, we're going to invest abroad because they, there, presumably, we can secure better returns on our investment. And I, I mean, like, in general, the whole idea that Hobson propagates is that empire abroad undermines democracy at home. Em I, sh I should have actually begun with this. Empire abroad undermines democracy at home. We'll come back to this phrase. So the modern foreign policy of Great Britain has been primarily a struggle for profitable, profitable markets of investment. And again, I think you can find very... I'm, I'm, Again, I specialize in ancient texts, not in modern data, but I do. I, I feel that this analysis, to a very large extent, uh, apl still applies today. That's what I want to say. But but again, those colleagues, those of you who specialize in data in empirical analysis, you can you can tell me how right or wrong I am. In 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 my my intuition is that this applies directly, but you can feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, or or point me to studies or whatever you want. Again, let let let's have a dialogue. Um, to a larger extent, every year Great Britain has uh, has been becoming a nation, uh, nation living upon tribute from abroad, nation living upon tribute from abroad, and the classes who enjoy this tribute have had an ever increasing. So not everybody enjoys the tribute from abroad, but the classes who enjoy this tribute have had an ever increasing incentive to employ the public policy, the public purse, and the public force to extend the field of their private investment. So the classes who enjoy this tribute. So again. Public policy, public purse, public force to extend the field of their private investment. Let me repeat this again. Private private benefits, public costs. Public costs, private benefits. Empire abroad endangers democracy at home. This is perhaps the most important fact in modern politics, and the obscurity in which it is wrapped has constituted the gravest danger to our state. Obscurity is going to be a very important point we'll get to. Aggressive imperialism is a source of great gain to the investor, who cannot find at home a profitable use he seeks for his capital and insists that his government should help him to uh, profitable and secure investments abroad. So, same thing. So, Hobson's analysis of central interests involved in imperialist expansion undoubtedly rested on the investor. Think about it. Global capitalism, you know, glo global investor class. What is, what is the role that they play today? Um, especially in you know, starting and perhaps p perpetuating wars. Again, as a question, as a question. But as he later pointed out, in order to make the analysis complete, it is at least equally important to bring it in the special role of the financier and his specific relation to the investor. Okay, financier and investors. What? Okay, l l let's see. If the special interest of the investor is liable to clash with the public interest, and induce a wrecking policy, still more dangerous the special interest of the financier, the general dealer in investments. These great businesses, banking, brokering, bill discounts, um, loan floating, company promoting, form the central ganglion of international capitalism. You can see why Lenin liked this uh, work. Speaking of the financiers, there, there is not a war, a revolution, an anarchist assassination, or any other public shock which is not gainful to the financiers. 
They are harpies who suck their gains from every new forced expenditure and every su su sudden disturbance of the public credit. The terrible sufferings of England and South Africa in the war um, has been a source of immense profit, immense so war, war, as a source of an immense profit to the big financiers who have best held out against the uncalculated waste and have recouped themselves by profitable war contracts and by freezing out the smaller interests in Transvaal. So this is South Africa, I would imagine, uh, the Anglo-Boer War. Um, these men are um, the... Um, are the only certain gainers are are the only certain gainers from the war, and most of their gains are made out of the public losses of their adopted country or the private losses of their fellow countrymen. Thus, Hobson argued that considering all the gains and costs of Britain's imperialist policy, it was clearly clearly detrimental to the interests of the nation. Clearly detrimental to the and again, so many people like again in the U.S. There are so many people who are going to make exactly the same argument in the U.S. right now, including. Uh, um, Including politicians of the kind of uh, of the highest uh, profile, highest profile U.S. politicians are going to make exactly this case. Um, so clearly detrimental to the interest of the nation and to the people as a whole. The contradiction of such venture was great gain. And again, notice, notice that this book by Berberoglu is written in 2003, 2003, and 20 years later. I think it's very pertinent. So t this book has been written 20 years ago, and again, it refers to a book. You know, to Hobson, who's writing more than a hundred years ago, right? So, you know, like the ideas that stand the test of time—that's that's at least my uh, uh, um, appraisal, right? The contradictions of such venture uh, was great gains for a minority involved in f uh, foreign investment and finance capital on the one hand, and the great expenditure of public money military on the other. The public expense in maintaining the empire was so great that this meant movement towards permanent debt budget for the state. Yes. So here's where we get to another very important. Uh, idea is that the way the war is financed is not through direct taxation, because if you were to officially declare war and officially impose a war tax, people would rebel. So instead, what you do is you uh, have public debt, you print money in order to finance this debt, this leads to an inflation, and inflation is a secret tax that people don't notice. Does this sound familiar? Again, Hobson is writing this more than 100 years ago. Is this, is this news to you? Um, creation of public debt is a normal and most imposing feature of imperialism. The creation of large growing public debt is thus not only necessary consequence of an imperialist expenditure, uh, too great for its current revenue or so, some sudden forced extortion of war, indemnity or other public penalty, it is a direct object of imperialist finance to create other debts just as it is an object of the private money lender to goad his clients into pecuniary difficulties in order that they may have recourse to him. So again, so he's talking about how uh, because the debt, you know, the, it's the global capitalists who finance the debts, it is in the interest of the global capitalism that the countries incur debt. Both Britain incur debt in um, acquiring a military and the countries abroad incur debt in order to just in general, kind of you know, forced into debt trap diplomacy, and then kind of Britain then or, or U.S. today has to debt finance its army in order to make sure that its foreign debts are repaid. But but the only people who really gain from this, Hobson alleges, uh, um, are the financiers, the international capitalist class, who have no country, who have no country, because we're talking about an international class, right? Whenever people say bad things about America, you shouldn't, or Americans, you shouldn't, because again, just as the British, Hobson argues, do not by and large, um, benefit from the policy, I think it's fair to say, although, again, you who specialize in empirical research will tell me, uh, you know, feel free to do your own research, but my impression is that the uh, average American does not benefit, again, does not benefit from this imperialist policy. It's only narrow sectional interest. Peace dividend, peace dividend is lost. Anyway, so direct military and naval expenditure. Naval exp by the way, naval expenditure, you know, freedom of the seas. We talk about this a lot, right? The rules-based international order. We make the rules, we reap the benefits. Mm. Um, so anyway, so direct military and naval expenditure increased faster than total expenditure, growth of trade, national income, any other indicator. Um, probably true, again, look, look at statistics in the US. How, how fast does the economy grow? How fast does the military expenditure grow? Um, in 1875, anyway, so, so he, he gives specific numbers, let's not go over this. Um, 
um, again, imperialist finance, the financial industrial professional classes who have shown, um, form the economic core of imperialism, have used their political power to extract these sums from the nation in order to improve their investments and open new fields for capital. So, again, the narrow sectional interests have, again, something like an oligarchy. We're not talking about democracy here. American democracy undermined. American democracy has been undermined for decades, just as was the British democracy undermined back then, right? So we're talking about um, political power, which the narrow sectional interests use uh, uh, to extract sums from the nation in order to fund ventures abroad, in order to find, uh, new, find and secure markets for investment, profitable markets for surplus investment and surplus goods. Anyway, um, the financial industrial capitalists who have mainly engineered this policy employ their ill-recognized business ends, have also made important bribes or concessions to other less directly benefited interests in order to keep their sympathy and ensure their support. Bribes and concessions. Bribes and concessions. Again, corruption. Corruption of big money in politics. The economic cost of militarism is therefore twofold. It greatly increased expense of the army, uh, must be defrayed by an impoverished people. So twofold. The, there's greater expense, so the expense is larger, but also the people are poorer. So you have twofold cost. But would the, would the people of Britain stand for a policy that thus pushes for constantly growing public debt? Ha! <laughs> Ask this, you know, would the American people support the policy that increases the debt year after year after year? The American debt is now higher than American GDP, right? Uh, and and the, the, the percentage, the, 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 um, the amount of money that you need to service the debt, right, grows every year as well. And, and who gets this money that's needed to service the debt, right? It's the financiers, it's not the ordinary people. Not 60% of the American population who live paycheck to paycheck, definitely. Anyway, so increasing militarization, long run decline in the standard of living, long run decline in the standard of living of the nation. People say people talk about populism as if it's a bad thing. No, I think I, I, if you read, a, you know, if if you understand populism the way that, for example, uh, uh, like in the sense in which um, Hobson here is writing, this is the kind of populism I definitely can get behind. If, if, of course, if this analysis is sound empirically, which is, again, I specialize in theory, not in empirical research, would they be willing to finance such a po policy had they been told of its actual dynamics? Again, this notion that this is concealed from the British public just as it is concealed from the American public today. We are the capitalist imperialists. Uh, were the capitalist imperialists forces openly to shift the burden of taxation on the shoulders of the people? So if you had a direct war tax, then people would rebel. It would be difficult under popular forms of government to operate such an expensive policy. The people must pay. The people will pay. But they must not know that they are paying or how much they are paying. And the payment must be spread over a long period of time as possible. Inflation. Inflation. The way you do this is through inflation. in inflationary tax. Okay. Hobson, detailed observation on the nature, causes, and manifestations of modern imperialism led him to the following inescapable conclusion. Our economic analysis has disclosed the fact that it is only the interest of competing cliques, cliques of businessmen, investors, contractors, export manufacturers, and certain professional classes that are antagonistic. It's like, again, on the eve of World War I, they talk about France versus Germany versus Britain versus Russia. Uh, Hobson says, no, people have interests in common. Again, Hobson is not a Marxist, but it's, you can almost hear an echo of Workers of the World Unite. The large group of people, again, I, I, I've said this in a video a couple, uh, a couple weeks ago or something like that. I say, it is my strong conviction that the overwhelming number of people have overwhelming interests in common. It is only the elites whose interests are antagonistic. And these elites, these cliques, usurp the authority and voice of the people. Usurp the authority and the voice of the people. They use the public resources to push their private interest. Again, we talk about this public and private. And spend the blood, money of the people in the vast and disastrous military gain. And now, very importantly, they feign national antagonisms. They feign national antagonisms, which have no basis in reality. It's like 
anybody who opposes this kind of uh, is called a traitor. Like, you don't want America to spend money on the military? Do you want China to win? Again, no, 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 let's not talk about today. Talk, talk about in Hobson's time. We know how the story ended. In 1905, we know how the story ended. Who won in World War I? You're telling people. Who, first of all, like, uh, people like to talk about, you know, the horrors of Second World War. And I want, like, when I read something like this, Hobson, I want to say that the causes of First World War are structural. They are deeply structural, and they have to do with capitalism. It's bad. It's bad form to just blame everything on capitalism as if it was, as if it was, you know, just um, like an empty label, a solution to all the, like, like a cause of all the problems. I understand. I understand. We have to be careful when we use the word capitalism. But at the same time, I think it's undeniable that there's a very strong structural force uh, that we be, we have to be aware of. If the problem is structural, if we are to solve it, we first need to realize what the problem is. The first step to solving the problem is realizing that the problem exists and the nature of the problem. The problem is structural in the first place, right? And uh, again, in 2020, like in, in the 21st century, we don't know how the how the uh, story is going to end. But in again, who was to blame for World War One? Who was the evil dictator or something like that? Who was the evil person in World War One? Who like the evil, inhumane conquerors who are supposed to be dealt with? I, I don't think we talk about World War One in these terms anymore, right? World War One is an unmitigated tragedy, a disaster. Nobody won in World War One. Everybody basically lost. Maybe some private interests gained, but by and large, all the people who died, all the things that were destroyed, if you think in terms of the environment, climate change is, co is uh, uh, controversial these days, but the think of the destruction of the environment. Think of the poisoning of the, envi of the environment, of just destruction of lived environment and destruction of life and destruction of capital and all of these resources that could have been used for productive purposes. All of the these resources that could have been used to treat diseases, to you know, advance technology. Instead, instead, just people, uh, you employ industrial means to slaughter each other in World War One. I. I don't think that anybody really won in World War One. And in in my Marxist analysis would be that all the horrors of the twenty on the, of the twentieth century and especially of the Second World War have to be traced to World War One. And there's this mythology. Manichaean mythology that there are evil people who do evil things for the sake of evil, and that's not what I see in Hobson's article. It's not evil people who do evil things for the sake of evil. No, it's a structural logic because you have a capitalist system which puts private gains against public interest, against the common interest. And I refuse, again, feel free to push back against me. Let's talk about this in detail in the seminars or what have you. Yeah, uh, um, but like, I refuse to subscribe to the Manichaean mythology about evil like I, in, in some sense i don't believe that evil exists hobson is not talking about evil he's talking about a, a system which is broken in which private interests take uh, uh, private interests usurp the voice of the people and it, it's a it's a structural problem it's not it's not because particularly people are evil and structural problems need to have structural solutions now what the solutions should be we'll talk about that in a second but i wanted to get this out anyway so um so you have the feigning of national antagonism and again this is why I talk about how nationalism is the, probably the biggest enemy of socialism, or, uh, biggest enemy of so, or perhaps biggest enemy of democracy. Again, empire at home, uh, empire abroad, empire abroad through this nationalist militaristic rhetoric undermines democracy at home. Empire abroad with this nationalistic militaristic rhetoric undermines democracy at home, and you cannot have a proper democratic discussion if anybody who doesn't who doesn't agree with you, you call the foreign agent, like a, like a spy for the enemy. Okay, and again, that's that's why it's good to have hindsight. With, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that Hobson was not a spy. He was not a German spy. He was not a French spy. He was, as far as we can tell, he was a, a genuinely a, a British patriot. Anyway, so it is not to the interest of the British people, either as producers of wealth or taxpayers, to risk a war like World War I, right? which was definitely not in the interest of the best swaths of the population. But it may serve the interest of the group of commercial politicians to promote this dangerous policy. And by the way, uh, again, I, this is empirical research I haven't done, but I'm sure, I'm sure that there were sectional people, there were individuals and there were corporations that probably benefited from World War I and World War II, who got richer, who got disproportionately richer. I'm pretty sure that's the case. The, uh, humanity lost, but particular individual interest triumphed. Mm. And again, I think it's a structural logic. I'm not trying to blame the I'm not. I, this is not a conspiracy theory. Again, uh, sociology is not a conspiracy theory. We're talking about structural logic. And, and structural systematic fallout of collective action. Anyway, 
But then also, Hobson says, war represents not the success but the failure of this policy. Of course, Hobson realizes this, and I think he's right, that in fact, you know, the militarism and nationalism is all fine, but nobody really wants a war. Like, you know, you have hawks in the U.S. who uh, warmonger against against China, but if the, the nuclear war actually broke out between the U.S. and China, I don't think that they would actually win. So they want militarism, but they don't want all-out war. Right? War, and and I think this was true for uh, militarist and war, warmonger in Britain at the eve, on the eve of World War One. Anyway, so war, however, represents not the success but the failure of this policy. Its normal and most perilous fruit, fruit, fruit is not war but militarism. Militarism. So long as this competitive expansion for territory and foreign markets is permitted to misrepresent, keyword, misrepresent, misrepresent itself as national policy, the antagonisms of interests seem real, seem, only seem, they're not real, but they seem real. And the people seat and bleed and toil to keep up an ever more expensive machinery of war. Colleagues, if you're not inspired by these words, either, either there's something I don't understand or you don't have a heart. Because I, I am deeply inspired. I'm, I'm inflamed by these words. And I've been trying to do this video for a while. I, I do keep, I talk about Hobson from time to time. I, I have a small segment on Hobson in my Coursera, just because this is so important. But I, I wanted to read this text in detail. Again, and these, these are quotes. These are quotes. This is Hobson himself writing. Anyway, but let's continue. So, as real as the economic manifestations and political military implications of modern British imperialism were... Although Hobson did not deny the immense power of economic factors, he nonetheless did not view imperialism as a necessary outcome of capitalist development. So this is where we get into this reformism. So Hobson is not a Marxist. He's not a communist. He, he's, he's a capitalist. He's a social democrat. Yeah, he believes in socialist policy. But in general, he's a capitalist. He's a laissez-faire capitalist. Right? Hobson readily admitted that the conditions of contemporary capitalism constitute the taproot of imperialism, but he denied that these conditions were unavoidable. Contrary to the argument developed by Lenin, so contrary to Lenin, Hobson repeatedly acknowledges that capitalism would indeed survive and prosper without imperialism. To Hobson, imperialism was a disease, a disease inflicted on an otherwise healthy body, that capitalism is a healthy body. Thus, in order for capitalism to prosper, imperialism, which costs uh, the people immense amounts that were wasted in the process of unnecessary militarization, were to be eliminated. Again, waste, waste, waste. Imperialism generates waste. It wastes resources, lives. It wastes away environment. It wastes away the lives of people, the livelihoods of people, and the future for us and for our children. And again, think of, think of Marx, uh, or think of, <laughs> we talked Nick Land, accelerationism, right? Uh, uh, capitalism is the last, is, is the, hopefully, you know, according to Marx, the last stage of human prehistory. Human beings don't rule themselves. We are wasted away. Our future is wasted away because of the structural logic. It's not people who rule humanity it's not it's not it's not us who, who we sat down and we decided that this militarization is a good policy for us no no it's a structural logic it's a failed perhaps prisoner's dilemma game mm. and um in fact yeah in nick land's terms it's this monstrous evil god steampunk to uh, begin who began as a steampunk evil god now a cyberpunk evil god global capitalism that that kind of just eats us alive and, and it, it, it seeks to eat the future of our children. It's capitalism that uh, grows stronger, freer, and emancipates itself, not humanity. Humanity, again, just risks dying in this unnecessary militarization. And again, let me just <laughs> digress for one more second. When I was recording my Coursera, when, whenever I talked about nuclear war, it always sounded like a strange thing to say. I always sounded uneasy because I thought nuclear terrorism is a real possibility, but nuclear war, no, that's, that's kind of... That's crazy talk, right? In, in 2021, that seemed to be crazy talk to me. Well, it's 2023, it no, no longer seems crazy talk to me. I, I, I wish I kind of live here, in beautiful city of Athens, Greece. I pr we, we, we philosophers, we have our gods, we pray to Apollo and to Athene. We pray that our worst expectations will not come to fruition. And that uh, reason will reason will triumph. It's again, you can when whenever you read these kinds of arguments, I think you can understand why people talk about socialism or barbarism, socialism or barbarism, unnecessary. What kind of barbarism? The barbarism of World War One. Anyway, and this change could come, thought Hobson, through political pressure by taxpayers, that would lead to the needed reforms. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Will American taxpayers? Because again, America spends. Uh, something on the order of, like, uh, in certain years, it's spent more than the rest of the world combined. So, you know, if we, if we are going to address these problems, America is the first country in which this needs to be addressed. And if the American taxpayers would be able to curb the military spending, to rein in the military-industrial complex, which hurts Americans, 
first and foremost, Hobson would say, Hobson would say, hurts Americans first and foremost, perhaps there's hope for humanity. But that's, that, seems to be, that seems to be the solution that Hobson envisions, that uh, uh, taxpayers in first world countries, in Britain of his day or in America or of our day, need to pressure politicians and reform, the military, uh, uh, defund the military industrial complex. There were no reasons in Hobson's mind that would indicate the necessity of imperialism. To dispel the notion of necessity, as was advanced by imperialist sympathizers of the period, Hobson pointed out time and again that the driving force behind imperialism is a definite class interest, class interest, and to eliminate imperialism, acts must be laid at the economic root of the tree. And in this way, the elimination of special privileges of the classes for whose interests imperialism work. Elimination of special privileges of the classes. Again, socialize the cost, privatize the benefit, socialism for the rich, bailouts for the rich, bailouts for Wall Street. I told you, uh, the failure, the, the destruction, the defeat of the Occupy movement at the hands of Obama administration uh, perhaps is a good candidate for the biggest tragedy of my generation. Anyway, um, since Hobson did not see an inevitable link between imperialism and capitalism, he believed that economic root could be cut even while capitalism prevailed. If consuming public in the country raised its standard of consumption to keep pace with every rise of productive powers, there would be no excess of goods or capital. So again, so what he says is that you have crisis of overproduction and crisis of surplus capital, but if only, so you have extra goods and extra money, but perhaps you could give extra money to the people at home and they could buy the extra goods. And so you would not need imperialism then. Mm -hmm. Standard of consumption to keep the pace with ever rising productive forces. Productive forces use increase in productivity not to increase the gains of capitalists, but to increase the standard of living. The standard of living of the Americans, I think, in real terms, has been more or less stagnant since 1971. Like the productivity has increased tremendously, but the average, you know, uh, the median um, standard of living has not increased, and in fact, perhaps it has decreased. Um, Deindustrialization, offshoring, all this other stuff. Again, this is Hobson writing in 1905. Very prescient book, no? Wouldn't you find? Foreign trade would indeed exist, but there would be no difficulty in exchanging a small surplus of our manufacturers for the food and raw materials we annually absorb. And all the savings could be made um, for unemployment if we choose at home industries. Home industries. Reshore. Reshore. <laughs> Have you heard this from high-profile American politicians? Anyway. What Hobson suggests then is quite clear. He advocates the abolition of imperialism, the breakup of monopolies, and the return to competitive laissez-faire capitalism. So even though I said that Hobson perhaps is a socialist, well, is he really a socialist? Do we see anything socialist in this argument? No. This is, this is perhaps a libertarian argument. Let me write this. Libertarianism. Libertarianism. Oops. No, 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 wouldn't you find, again, return to competitive laissez-faire capitalism. Break up of monopolies, break up, you know, the, the power of the oligarchy who corrupt the political process and return to competitive laissez-faire capitalism. Interesting, interesting. Again, 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 this is, this is not Marxism. This is not Marxism. This, let me repeat this once again. And it's like, um, many of my students, like, I, I know that anarchist capitalism is like or libertarianism is in vogue these days uh colleagues my students who are who are interested in anarchist capitalism doesn't this sound like an anarchist capitalist uh argument to you isn't there kind of common ground for us anyway these are interesting uh topics for further discussion i'm sure there's a million other things i could have said but i think i've said enough um i think i'm going to end it here uh, thank you, colleagues, so very much for your uh, company. I hope you have found this to be a useful stream. I highly recommend Hobson. If you want to uh, uh, um, know more about this, there's a bunch of videos available on my channel specifically about Hobson and in general about how Hobson um, fits into a larger history of political theory, history of social theory, history of international political theory, feel free to check this out. And of course, like in, in general, the uh, most important framework for my understanding of all this is my Coursera course, which is Introduction to Political Philosophy. All the lectures are available here on YouTube. Feel free to subscribe, <laughs> leave a like, leave, leave a comment or something like that. 
Um, so uh, actually, because this is live, I think I'm going to take questions now, but I'm going to stop the recording here. So once again, thank you so very much, colleagues. Take care, take care. And let's hope, let's hope. Again, socialism or barbarism, let's hope that, uh, well, okay. Uh, in, in the words of Hobson, it's return to laissez-faire capitalism, destruction of monopolies or barbarism. Okay, let's let's <laughs> reach. Let's say democracy, democracy or barbarism. Let's put it that way. Democracy or barbarism. Let's hope democracy will win. Thank you, colleagues. Take care. Okay, and since we're also streaming this, let me take a look at the chat. If anybody is writing anything in chat, no, there's nobody in the chat. I think <laughs> that's okay, colleagues. Anyway, we're gonna finish this now here. I wish everybody all the best. Take care.